let me let me hand over to Professor Claire Langhammer, the, the director of the IHR, to, to welcome you all today. Hello, everybody, um, and welcome. Um, I am only just the new director. I only started on the 1st of October, so I am still um, discovering the very many joys of working at the Institute of Historical Research. Um, I'm also a historian of modern Britain, currently working on emotions in the workplace, so I have a very particular interest in the past, present and future of work. But on behalf of everybody at the IHR, I really want to warmly welcome you to today's workshop on recovering from the pandemic. The IHR is based at Senate House London, but it has a national remit to support and advocate for history and for historians. We place curiosity and collaboration um, right at the heart of everything that we do. Drawing together the historically minded people through activities, um, operating as a hub for thinking creatively about the past in the present and mobilize, mobilizing knowledge to inform contemporary challenges. That's a key part um, of our mission. And that's part of our mission that history and policy is crucial to. It's also a network that brings together different perspectives and expertise to really affect positive change. Um, it's a network that assumes that history matters um, and that it has a real social value. And within the history and policy umbrella, the Trade Union and Employment Forum is a tremendously vibrant and important part, um, a network of experts and interested groups. It meets several times a year, bringing together trade unions with historians and others, um, locating trade union issues within a historical background and exploring different perspectives in the past and present in order to suggest new lines and policies for the future. I'm going to hand back to, to Philip Murphy in a second, but I really just want to say here um, that I'm looking forward to a really energetic, um, productive, but also intellectually challenging workshop today. Um, and you're all very welcome. Thanks, Philip. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. And let, let me just uh, reiterate close thanks to the Trade Union Employment Forum uh, Organising Committee for putting this wonderful programme together, and particularly Tom Wilson, um, who's done a, a great deal of work behind it. Um, we have uh, three speakers for this morning's session. Each speaker will speak for about uh, 20 minutes. We're going to have a slightly different uh, running order uh, because Toby Perkins has got parliamentary duties that he has to rush off to. So Toby will be speaking second. So let me, let me just introduce our three very distinguished speakers. Um, we begin with Christina McCani, who became General Secretary of Unison in January this year. Unison is the UK's biggest trade union with 1.3 million members. Uh, Christina was born in Glasgow and grew up on the uh, Drum Chapel estate, um, massive housing scheme. Uh, she joined the Communist Party as a teenager, but then joined Labour in her 20s. Um, she first worked as a civil servant uh, and then uh, in the Glasgow office and then head office of the GMB, where she moved to Nalgo before it became Unison. She has a reputation as a formidable negotiator and campaigner. It's great to have her to, to start this conference today. So going second will be Toby Perkins, who was elected MP for Chesterfield and Staverley in 2010. The seat he's held ever since. Uh, in April 2020, uh, Toby was appointed as Shadow Minister for Apprenticeships and Lifelong Learning by the new Labour leader, Keir Starmer. In that post, he's made a name for himself, challenging the decline in apprenticeships and cuts in FE funding. So uh, great to hear from Toby. And finally, um, a distinguished historian of modern Britain, 
Professor David Edgerton, a graduate of St. John's College, Oxford and Imperial College, London. Um, after teaching at the University of Manchester, he became founding director of the Center uh, for the History of Science, Medicine, Technology and Medicine at Imperial College, London, um, where he was also Hans Rousing professor. Uh, he moved from there to uh, King's College uh, in August 2013. And for my money, his 2018 book, uh, The Rise and Fall of the British Nation, a 20th century history, is the most important single survey on modern Britain to be, to be published for a very long time and deserves, deserves your attention, ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't already read it. So uh, a fantastic panel. Let me, let me uh, ask Christina to, to start us off. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Philip. Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, I, I'm, I'm Christina McInerney and I'm General Secretary of Unison. I was elected earlier this year. And uh, but uh, as Philip said, I've worked, for many, I've worked for many years in the trade union movement. In fact, <clears throat> my time at the GMB, which was a long time ago, um, I worked when I came to their head office, uh, which was in Claygate in Surrey at the time, I worked alongside Tom. And John Edmonds was our boss, and he was very formidable, I have to say. <laughs> but it was a great learning time for me because we were surrounded. We had a fantastic research department, and um, and it was very challenging. And, and if you produced a paper, you were basically you had to be able to stand up there and defend what was in your paper. And it's, it was a great learning for me. I'm, I, I see Tom nodding. I'm sure it was the same for him. Uh, so just some thoughts from me really on, on all of these things. So, you know, history has shown us that um, uh, women's skills in particular have been traditionally undervalued. You know, uh, uh, some of the lowest paid jobs that, that we, you look across society, uh, cleaning, catering, care work, childcare, uh, retail, uh, all jobs where there's a very high percentage of, of women working in them. And that's not, an, that's not a coincidence that they then are the jobs that are the lowest paid. And it's because of the value or lack, lack of value that we put on these jobs. You know, the reality is we pay, um, we pay people more to look after animals in a zoo than we do to look after people with learning disabilities. We pay people more to collect tickets at a train station or a tube station than we do to look after children in a nursery. That's a fact today, and sadly in too many areas. And, and it's partly to do with lack of organization in those areas, but also it is to do with the lack of value we place on the skills because they're seen as traditional women's jobs. Um, and it took many years to get the equal pay for work and equal value legislation up and running. Uh, but even with that, uh, we still have huge gender pay gap, ethnicity pay gap, and of course a disability pay gap that we're now, we're now able to evidence by the, the research that we've done on all of this. And of course, the big gap is access to training, particularly workplace training. We all know from the statistics and certainly the research we do within Unison, uh, we know that uh, for many of our members, access to training is uh, almost minimal and that you're far more likely to get uh, access to training if you already have a degree or other professional qualification. And I see there's quite a lot of academics here and I would just say as a bit of, a, a bit of an interest, go back and look at your own organisation, look at your university uh, where you or where you work and actually ask some questions about where the budget is spent in terms of staff training. And I'll be astonished if it's not exactly what I've just said, which is the vast majority of it will be spent on those staff who've already got professional qualifications. And a tiny fraction, and I mean a tiny fraction of it, will be spent on staff who don't have those, those professional qualifications. And you have to ask why and what, what does this mean in terms of enhancing people's skills and opportunities within the workplace? So um, we've already seen, of course, uh, from the pandemic that it has uh, used the, an oft-used phrase, shone a light on what is actually the, what are actually the important jobs in society. 
you know, we all became totally dependent on the delivery driver that was taking, bringing things to our home. But more than that, there was all that huge group of people in the workforce who never stopped working, basically. So when we went into lockdown 18 months ago, most of us were probably really worried about what does this mean? What's, what will the impact be on me? Um, but actually, for a large group of, of workers, many of them in, in unit, unions and members, there was no option for them. They still went into work every day to look after vulnerable people, people with uh, some kind of disability, or just to care for people in a, not just, but to care for people in a hospital. Their job, but, but even also the people who, you know, keep the streets clean, empty our bins, and also sadly bury our bed. They all kept working all through the pandemic, and they're the ones again least likely to have access to training. And I'll just use um, care as an example. Uh, because we're the main union for care workers. Uh, we have about 150,000 care workers and membership that we can identify. We have email addresses for 120,000 of them, so we try and keep a regular contact with them. And during the pandemic, we were giving them lots of uh, information and advice. But we also asked them questions about the, what they get in terms of training. And <clears throat> about a third of this is pre-pandemic, about a third of them would say, Came back and said they did no training at all in the previous 12 months, not nothing. About another third said, um, in fact, about half of what was left said they'd had um, a, a, around about uh, no more than two hours training, so it would maybe some specific, uh, some kind of awareness or uh, some kind of infection control issue. They've got very specific, small access, short access to some kind of training. And even when you look at what happens when people start work in a sector like that, very few get any proper induction. Uh, it ranges from anything from being handed a video and told to go away and look at the video, which might last half an hour, uh, to just being walked around the building and told that this is what the job is. Uh, and up to you know some good employers that will maybe give them a few days training take them through different procedures, etc. But there's quite a big variation, but no one gets anything like a proper induction or a proper introduction to the job that they do. And of course, what we've seen through the pandemic is that um, this idea that a care worker, you know, I think there's a thought that a care worker is a care worker is a care worker, and there's very little variation in the jobs that they do, and that's absolutely untrue. And when we look at the jobs that, that our members do, and we ask them to describe the jobs that they do, there is a huge variation. Everything from very, you know, things that would be done by a nurse in a hospital, being done by care workers, to the sort of cleaning and looking after people and the human interaction element of their job. And yet we know that the difference in pay between someone who's just started and someone who's been a care worker for five years and gained lots of skills and experience, the difference in pay is six pence an hour. And so it almost doesn't matter, and a lot of them feel this, it doesn't matter how much training they get or whether they take additional skills because it won't have an impact on their pay. So um, you're in that kind of bind where uh, they don't get access to training, but even if they did, some of them would say, I don't want to do it anyway because... I'm not intending to stay here very long because there's no possibility of this actually changing the way I'm paid or the way I'm viewed. So, um, so there, there is no uh, sort of parity of esteem uh, uh, between what they do and what other groups of workers do in similar circumstances. Uh, and uh, if you look, and I'll take another example. If you look at... Um, uh, early years, uh, so I, I dealt with their early years members for many years. Early years used to be seen as quite a, a, a skilled job, but still it is a very skilled job. But if you, even in a sector where there is training, so uh, most early years workers will have done a two year course, training course, it used to be called the nursery nurse examination board, NNEB. I can't remember what it's called now, but um, it's still a two-year training course. You will do some kind of diploma, at the early years diploma, and uh, and for, in many circumstances in, a, in an early years setting, that person will be the most experienced and skilled person in terms of early years development and care. Even many of the teachers who, who work in early years will not necessarily 
have specialised in early years because you don't have to have specialised in early years to be an early years teacher in some settings. So the nursery nurses, as the early years specialist, will be the one that's got the most experience. And in the past, so about 20 years ago, a nursery nurse could expect to earn about two thirds of a teacher's salary. That has now dropped to anything between a third and a half of a te an average teacher's salary. There are some variations. I don't want this to sound as though it's everywhere. There are some significant variations to this, which is in some areas where we've maintained a large public sector uh, uh, early years provision, like in Scotland, where they've got a much higher percentage of early years provision delivered through local authorities. Pay levels have been better, they've been more consistent. Uh, they've kept pace with teachers' pay, so they're still roughly about two thirds of a teacher's pay. But across the, most of the rest of the UK, that has dropped significantly. And a big part of that is because less and less of early years is being delivered through uh, by people who are paid on public sector paying conditions and are predominantly being paid on very low private sector paying conditions. And it doesn't matter that you, you're able to make the case about skills. The difficulty is actually being able to push up the rates of the pay. Um, in the private sector for early years, for example, it's, it's quite often barely above national minimum wage. So the pandemic has, uh, and if you look at cleaning and catering, again, we've had all of this, uh, you know, it's seen as uh, low paid, low skilled work. And yet through the pandemic, we saw that cleaning in particular actually is critically important to many sectors on things like keeping people safe, as we've always known, but also even on infection control. And so staff were expected to do a much more uh, deep cleaning, much more extensive cleaning, uh, being, and, and actually were given some additional training on the use of chemicals, what, 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 man, what's, what was best in infection control, the best way to actually clean, the best way to uh, you know, wash out the cloths and the, the equipment that you, you were using. So we actually saw a bit of an uptake in terms of some quick on-the-job training for some of the staff there. Um, so there was an increased awareness of it. And yet it's still the sector where in most public sector organisations and indeed in many private sector organisations, when there's a discussion about we quickly need to save some money, and uh, you know this again, it's huge in the university sector and academia, but the first port of call is nearly always the cleaning and catering staff. Well, let's outsource them then. Let's not pay them the rates of pay that we pay everybody else in this organisation. Let's not pay them a, 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 an let's not pay them a, a, a pension. Uh, let's not give them any training. Let's just hand all that over to some other organisation that will pay them at the minimum wage, and that will save us some money. It's nearly always the first point of call when sometimes I think I'd like to be flying the wall in the the uh, the boards of some of the organisations that do this when they have this conversation and they think we need to save X thousand pounds a year. Uh, what should we? What will we cut or what will we do to save it? And it's always always the lowest paid staff that are the first the first thing that pops into people's head um so obviously that's a big issue for us we do need i'm sorry i realize i'm going on too long we'll we do need a complete rethink we need a comprehensive workforce strategy uh, backed up by investment and you know uh, we're expecting the chancellor's announcement today let's say i'm not holding my breath even though they're saying they're lifting the public sector pay freeze i doubt if there's going to be a big chunk of money thrown at, at um at public sector workers but the government talks about needing a, a high skilled high paid workforce well um we have to start by recognizing the skills that are already out there it's not that all of these jobs are low skilled many of them are very highly skilled and i i did say the care sector being a fantastic example of that, where people are, are, are delivering complex uh, support to people with very um, diverse needs. And they need a whole range of different skills to be able to do that, skills that are just not recognised at the moment. And one of the key things we're doing in Unison 
is that we are now looking at our offer for our members in terms of skills. So one of the key things I want to do is to deliver a new Unison College, we're calling it, and I have to thank Tom Wilson for giving us support and, and, um, and for all the work he's doing for us around that. Um, but we're actually looking to change the offer so that it's about trade union support, but also about professional development and actually supporting people to get the best out of what they can at work, be able to see other opportunities for themselves, but also about personal development as well. We want a kind of, you know, three different roles to the Unison College and to give a much higher importance and relevance to training within our own organisation and to work with employers to put this firmly on the agenda to say that training and development has to be something that is offered and available to all staff within an organisation not just those seem to be already delivering professional services. So I'll stop there. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much, Christina. Um, let me um, let me kind of go back to the, the running order uh, today, because if David wouldn't mind, uh, uh, Toby Perkins has said he can join us at uh, 10 past 11. Christina has been, uh, you know, tremendously good in keeping keeping to time. So we, we now have um, over over fifteen minutes. So David, would you mind uh, uh, coming in now and and speaking, uh, and then we'll we'll go on to to Toby, and that should work perfectly well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yes, not at all. No, no, no problem at all. Um, well, uh, thank you for, for your introduction, uh, Philip. Um, I'm going to really go back to the to the, to the Second World War uh, and to the immediate post-war years to to reflect on whether there are any lessons uh, for us. And the last um, five years, we've had two major uh, events for which uh, state and society have been evidently unprepared. That's to say, uh, Brexit and uh, COVID. And it's rather a reminder, I think, of the limitations of British political discourse, that historical analogies abounded uh, in, in the discussion of both those uh, cases. Uh, certain stories about the Second World War were, of course, particularly uh, prominent. Now, none of those um, of us interested in history and, uh, and, and, and uh, policy ought to be uh, displeased about the, the significance of uh, uh, historical uh, analogies in, 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 in public discourse. But we have a problem, which it's, it's not that the, there's a lack of history in British public discourse, but if I could put it this way, it's usually the wrong sort of history. And that is particularly the case for analogies with the Second World War. Uh, we have to distinguish, I think, between stories about the real war uh, stories from wartime itself, and the stories that were told about the war, uh, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, which are still the basis of, of most commentary uh, on the Second World War. Uh, these stories were uh, focused on the wonders of being alone, uh, turning away from Europe, finding national solidarities, uh, new national solidarities, uh, and creating a welfare state. Now, this, the, the, these were stories which had the Tory and Labour versions. There was, as it were, the Tory Battle of Britain version and the Labour Blitz to Beverage uh, version. And in the case of COVID, the analogies uh, uh, made with the war were bipartisan. The coming together, we're all in it together uh, stories. But um, we were being misled by these accounts of, uh, uh, of, of, of war and what was happening in COVID. I was particularly struck by claims that the government was being forced to respond to COVID with quotes, social democracy on steroids. I mean, that was a claim made by a historian, that there would be a strengthened welfare state immediately created and that that 
would last. That's to say the war on COVID would bring about a massive social change of the sort that the books said World War II had created in the form of the welfare state. A very resonant uh, 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 image. And of course, it was uh, um, uh, uh, filled out with some, with some observations around um, uh, the, the new um, uh, uh, emphasis there was on, on uh, where a hidden working class that suddenly emerges into, into, into visibility uh, during times of, of, uh, of, of, of crisis. Anyway, I want to challenge that story, uh, both in terms of what happened in the war and uh, in, in COVID. As surprising as it may seem, the United Kingdom had a remarkably comprehensive welfare state for the working class in 1939. The working class being, let's say, 75% of the population. The UK fought the Second World War with this pre-war welfare state. Uh, indeed, services for the old, uh, in schools, and much else in, in the welfare system got much worse as a result of the war. Not a story that we commonly uh, hear, but very clear to any uh, reader of um, Titmus's history of its, some of the social services. What was important in the war in terms of welfare was the development of plans for the future, beverage. Um, but what was the context for these plans? Uh, it was radically different from the COVID context, particularly political. There was, of course, a coalition government created in 1940. Interestingly, we don't reflect enough on why Labour was in the coalition in 1940. Because the answer isn't that uh, Labour's parliamentary strength was required to create a coalition uh, to fight the war on the basis of greater national unity. Uh, the national government had a massive majority uh, and, and Labour a very small number of seats. So what was crucial were two things. The degree of support Labour had in the country, rather than in Parliament, um, and the crucial need of the government to have the support of the wider Labour movement. Labour mattered. Everybody knew that Labour markets would tighten in the modern terminology, that trade union membership would increase, that the power of Labour would rise, that wages would rise, and indeed all this happened. In short, what mattered uh, was the extra parliamentary power of Labour, not its parliamentary power. The second point is that Labour had uh, an alternative programme to the Tories. The parties were clearly uh, differentiated. Uh, if electoral hostilities were suspended, ideological differentiation remained very, very present. Now, did war bring parties and people together? That is the uh, uh, surprisingly common uh, assumption. Now, it's certainly the case that the war uh, brought people together in the sense of uh, uh, bringing uh, people who hadn't previously been together in a barracks or in a, in a factory or on board uh, a ship. But the implication that this, this um, uh, uh, meant that people got on better is not necessarily the case at all. Uh, in, you could argue indeed that class antagonism got stronger as a result of this mixing rather than weaker. Indeed, the Labour vote in 1945 seems to me, needs to be understood primarily as a, um, a case of Labour gaining working class voters and the Tories losing working class voters. Uh, yet we, we tend, I think, far too often 
to assume that Labour was gaining, already had the working class vote, which it certainly did not. Um, otherwise, it would have had 75% of the, of the vote. Um, uh, and of gaining middle class uh, voters. I mean, doubtless it did uh, uh, gain some, but the, the great majority of this new vote was a working class uh, vote. Um, in any case, uh, the, the, the idea that at some general level, uh, um, uh, 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 people's life chances and, and experiences became more equal during the war seems to me to be uh, open uh, to doubt. Uh, the Blitz didn't bring everyone together. The Blitz was highly concentrated in um, particular cities, uh, in particular parts of cities. The great majority of the British population were not subject to aerial uh, bombing, uh, for example. The war introduced uh, very important new divisions between, for example, those who were conscripted uh, and didn't get very much pay, and those, uh, uh, for example, who went into the munitions industries, who got much better facilities than, say, miners or textile workers, as well as higher, um, higher wages. Uh, people concerned working in, 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 in welfare uh, were very much at the bottom of the heap uh, during the Second World War, uh, as in um, the case of uh, COVID and, of course, before uh, COVID. In other words, we have you know, far too rosy a view of, uh, of the effects of the, uh, of, of, of the war. Now, this is not to say that in, in some dimensions, equality increased, and that's certainly true uh, in the, the, the case of uh, income, where very high taxation on, 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 on the wealthy in, in particular, narrow differentials. There was also a very radical narrowing of differentials within the workplace between, the, as the language uh, had it, the skilled and the semi-skilled and, uh, and, the, and, the, um, and the unskilled um, uh, 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 as well. And of course, in the case of rationing, uh, the, uh, there was um, uh, a, a an equalization of the basic uh, diet. But even in that case, we need to recognize, and this is surprisingly rarely pointed out, that if you were in the armed services, your food wasn't rationed, at least not in the same way as it was for civilians. And if you're working in the munitions industries, you got food off the ration, uh, uh, say in addition to, to the ration in your workplace. So even at the level of food supply, there were hidden uh, discriminations, which were really uh, very uh, uh, significant. And I haven't even talked about the ability of the rich to go to restaurants uh, to eat off the off the um, off the uh, off the off, off the ranch. So, um, so the situation is is very uh, uh, politics. Wartime politics uh, also mattered a very great deal in the creation of new policies during the war itself. Uh, the, 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 the beverage report wouldn't have been the beverage report had not Labour been in power and uh, Labour been powerful uh, in, in extra parliamentary uh, terms. Having said that, the victory of Labour in 1945 mattered a very great deal. Labour did not create the welfare state, uh, uh, but it did reform it, and it reformed it in specifically Labour ways. Uh, the creation of the National Health Service, the creation of a nationalised um, uh, uh, health and well, the general national in insurance system were very important uh, uh, developments. So I think we should think much more actually about 1945 than we do. Uh, and much less of 1940 as a critical turning. I mean, it's very striking that um, the Ken Loach's film, um, The Spirit of 1945, uh, was really about the spirit of 1940. Uh, and that is indeed a very common, um, common theme in Labour Party reflections on, on, its, on, it, on its part. There's a, there's a, there's a surprising uh, lack of 
um, of, of concern with the distinctiveness of 1920. Now the situation with COVID is of course very, very different. Labour is not in a coalition, um, though it suspended uh, a, a much parliamentary opposition to conservative uh, policy, it got nothing in return. Um, nor is it especially popular in the country. Uh, uh, it doesn't obviously stand for an alternative. And during the war, uh, during the uh, COVID, uh, uh, organized labor was of course weakened by the, by the, by, by, by the, um, the closing down of um, a significant part of the economy though, as we've heard, uh, very importantly, certainly not, uh, not, not all. Uh, to the extent that there was, as it were, a, a new welfare state uh, created, it was a, a radically different kind to the, to, to, to the one created after 1945. The main welfare provisions in the sense of furlough went via employers, not, didn't go to, directly to workers. Very telling, very telling. Uh, sick pay was not increased. I think that was extraordinarily uh, uh, important. Um, uh, and, it, and there was relatively little pressure from Labour, it has to be said, to, to do anything um, uh, uh, about. Uh, it, it is, to my mind, a major scam that that, 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 that wasn't. Uh, uh, the uh, universal credit uplift uh, was temporary, uh, and and so it and so it so it so it has been. More than that, the main thrust of medical politics, call it something, was in fact to privatise uh, the whole sorry saga of test trace and don't really bother about isolation, was a private effort, state funded but essentially private. Um, much else was done privately separate from the NHS, though labelled uh, NHS. I mean, here we have a, 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 um, a, a crisis as opportunity to transform uh, uh, the NHS in a, in a very, very particular uh, uh, direction. And we're now seeing the use of the government using uh, propaganda to have patients turn against doctors uh, uh, and, and health service staff more. More, more generally, this is this is serious politics, and it isn't the politics of social uh, uh, solidarity. Uh, COVID was used as an opportunity to reinforce a certain anti-statism uh, as well. Uh, one can't look at the Tory benches, the maskless Tory benches, you know, without uh, it being very, very obvious that a very particular uh, ideological messages are being sent out, which are absolutely and deliberately so counter to solidaristic messages. Um, and then we had uh, an extraordinary uh, indulgence in um, uh, fantasies of British scientific uh, uh, creativity. There wasn't, uh, and it's easy to forget this uh, uh, now, a so-called ventilator challenge at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, an attempt to uh, conjure a medical instrument industry out of thin air, based quite explicitly on an utterly false analogy with Spitfires. The idea was that uh, Churchill and Lord Beaverbrook had created uh, factories and, 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 and airplanes in the emergency of 19, uh, in 1940, that what needed was a new uh, uh, paratical entrepreneurial spirit uh, and everything would be uh, all right. Well, if, if the UK had depended on conjuring Spitfires out of midair in, in 1940, it would certainly have lost uh, the, battle of, uh, the Battle of Britain. Uh, Thank and you. indeed- David, it's David, can, I, can I perhaps ask you to, to sort of wind up at, at that point and, and let us okay. um, and, and bring bring Toby in. Then we'll come back to you for, for some questions, but you've given us a, a huge amount to think about there. Okay. Um, I, and, I, I, and, 
I'm, I'm, I'm certainly happy to stop and, <laughs> and, and go thank on you very questions. much yeah, go on so um let me uh, uh just introduce uh, uh toby toby perkins uh who as i mentioned at the beginning is uh, shadow minister for apprenticeships and lifelong learning and uh we're very grateful to him for making the time to to join us today so over to you toby well, thank you uh, very much indeed, Philip. I was very much enjoying David's uh, historical um, background and uh, uh, and that history. Um, I'll, my response, I'm afraid, will um, delve less into the history and, and more into uh, uh, into the current. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And and in terms of the question about how um, we try and create a, a skills approach emerging from the pandemic. That particularly ensures that the most marginalized groups are not forgotten about it's an incredibly timely day on budget day for us to be uh, considering these questions unfortunately i won't be able to um, to stay on uh, the the call as long as i would have uh, originally planned because of the parliamentary commitments i've got um, but i think as as people will know um, there's been a, a huge erosion of, of employment rights over the last um, decade and combined with the lowest uh, the longest wage stagnation uh, in recent history and a continued um, decline in, in workplace training uh, over many years, which is, is around 37% um, of companies uh, saying that they did absolutely no training whatsoever in the last uh, 12 months. Um, there's been successive um, cuts to further education and, and adult education budgets seen since 2010 um, with uh, a, Further education and education funding being cut by as much as 50% in real terms over that time. And uh, with the impact on um, the bottom end of our labour market, particularly from uh, the big reduction in migrant labour uh, post Brexit and, um, and the start of the COVID pandemic, uh, there is a real moment of opportunity, I believe, for the labour movement. Um, to, uh, to to sort of reassert the value of labour uh, and for the uh, the trade union movement and uh, um, the labour opposition uh, to to assert the need for firstly recognising um, in a variety of ways the value of labour and also for that investment in skills uh, which is is long overdue. Um, I'm going to touch upon a number of, of uh, issues very quickly. Um, the, the, one, the first one that is very central to our thoughts at the moment is the government's upcoming uh, skills bill. There are real concerns about how effective Chambers of Commerce will be um, as the organisation at the head of local skills improvement plans. And, and for those who don't know, local skills improvement plans but will play a very central role in adult education uh, funding in um, the strategic direction that colleges um, particularly uh, follow, uh, a college principal who runs a, a college that is economically sound will be able to be dismissed if they considered not to be following the local skills improvement plans closely enough. And those local skills improvement plans are in the hands of uh, chambers of commerce uh, who are very varied organisations, some very strong ones, some much less strong ones. Um, and it is our view that local skills improvement plans should be uh, a document that's brought, that bring together the strengths of further education sector, employers, uh, local devolved um, uh, metro mayors and local devolved uh, administrations. Um, and, uh, and of course, crucially, listen to learners too. Um, there's virtually no mention of learners uh, within the skills bill. Um, so uh, we also think the skills bill is a very centralising document that, that places a lot more powers in the hands of Secretary of State and uh, envisages no role for local local for uh, LEPs uh, and uh, envisages no uh, role um, particularly for Metro Mayors, uh, which is it sort of uh, seems to be very much in the face of the devolution talk that was uh, prominent in the government uh, four or five years ago. Um, we see careers guidance as key in raising aspiration and ensuring young people are aware of the opportunities that exist 
um, and, and we want to see a real sort of parity of a theme between um, apprenticeship, vocational education and, uh, and, and higher education. Um, in terms of uh, the, the government also introducing a lifetime skills guarantee, but so far I've refused to put that on the statutory footing, so it's very hard to see what the word guarantee uh, really means in that context if it has no statutory weight. And, and so one of the amendments that we've had an, an amount that we've had a lot of support in the House of Lords for is for the lifetime skills guarantee for the um, the ability to study a level three qualification to, to be on a statutory uh, footing and for um, that to be available to people who are retraining as well as those who uh, have never done a level three qualification when the Prime Minister announced the uh, introduction or reintroduction of the lifetime skills guarantee. Um, he was talking a lot about the need for people to move from one profession to another. But if you are already have a level three qualification, for example, in tourism, and you want to move into the health sector, you'll be prevented from um, getting funding for your level three qualification because you already have one uh, in a different uh, in a different environment. Um, so we think that that is a significant mistake, and, and nine million jobs. Um, are excluded from the uh, the areas that are funded on the lifetime um, skills guarantee. We also think there's a real need uh, for more to be done in terms of maintenance, because one of the things that, that stops people, particularly later in their careers, from retraining is, is being able to put food on the table whilst they're uh, whilst they're doing that. And we think a, an approach that recognises the um, that for many people retraining needs to happen. Uh, alongside their work rather than um, on the basis of taking a year away from the career um, and also that there is a need to support in funding terms people to retrain uh, is uh, is really important. Um, we're very strongly opposed to the government's decision to defund BTEX. We think BTEX you know continue to um, be understood and respected by both employers and learners uh, and the government appear to be um, wanting to trash the BTEC brand in order to promote their T-levels. Um, but uh, T-levels have never had um, a, a year group who's actually completed them. There's huge fears that the amount of work experience envisioned in T-levels um, will not be able to be found. And as a result, that um, there will be far fewer T-level courses available, T-level places available than there are for current level three BTEC. And government have had nothing to say uh, about uh, what that means in terms of the number of students who, who simply won't have a level three qualification available to study. Um, in terms of workplace training, uh, we were strongly opposed to the uh, abolition of the Union Learning Fund, and, and it's, um, you know, we, we consider the government foolish um, uh, and ideological to cut that funding. Uh, and we, we think there is a real need for great, far greater investment in workplace training. Um, and uh, I think in terms of um, the number of young people who are uh, not in employment, education or training, uh, there is real evidence from that, that we need far greater commitment to careers, uh, guidance to work experience and to uh, expanding the horizons and, and uh, opportunities that are available to people, particularly from more deprived communities. Um, in terms of apprenticeships, since you introduction the apprenticeship levy, we've seen uh, a big fall um, in the number of people doing apprenticeships, particularly level two and three apprenticeships. And we see apprenticeships as the gold standard um, in uh, careers and, and we think, uh, in, in skills I should say, and we think there should be um, far greater uh, investment in ensuring that any employer that is capable and wants to take on uh, an apprentice is, uh, is is able to do so. Um, in terms of um, uh, ensuring that skills and opportunities are available to people uh, at all aspects in our community, we're working closely with the Black FE Leadership Group to highlight how BAME students are, are in, are consistently failed in the further education sector. Um, we, we see that across the whole um, the, the whole sort of different uh, um, different sectors of, of uh, the BAME community. At, at, at uh, 
from the age of 16 onwards, um, whether they are in a, a, a group that has performed better than white students or in a group that has performed worse than white students, from the age of 16 uh, onwards, they, uh, their progress is, is less good uh, than white students. And um, in terms of accessing apprenticeships, um, same students with uh, equivalent degrees, uh, equivalent qualifications to white students um, get access to far fewer opportunities. So we, we see a, a real need for uh, that uh, situation to be tackled. In the first 100 days of a Labour government, workers and employers um, would be brought together to negotiate pay and conditions uh, in every sector. Um, and we will be looking to uh, introduce the right to flexible working um, to all workers uh, and, uh, and for zero hours contracts um, to be abolished. Um, and uh, a future Labour government will be looking to um, hugely reduce the amount of our workplace, our workforce, who is currently in insecure employment um, through ensuring that, that rights and protections, including statutory sick pay and uh, national minimum wage entitlement, holiday pay, paired parental leave uh, and pr protection against unfair dismissal would be uh, available to workers from day one. Um, alongside uh, this, uh, alongside um, that Labour's commitment to extend statutory sick pay to the self-employed um, would mean 6.1 million additional working people eligible to claim statutory um, sick pay. So going forward, I, I think there is a real need coming out of the pandemic and with the staffing and skills shortages um, that are uh, so prevalent across uh, our economy. Um, for government, trade unions, uh, employers uh, to work collectively to, to understand this responsibility to skill up the next generation, to um, work collectively to ensure uh, that Britain's future is one in which workers are uh, respected uh, and uh, valued, uh, and that employers recognise their responsibility um, to, uh, to support people to get the skills that, that employers uh, desperately need and, and will have a huge impact uh, on the productivity challenge that has blighted our economy, particularly in the last 11 years, but that actually took for quite some time before that. So I'm going to uh, leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to address you. Uh, apologies that uh, I'm not able to uh, stay on uh, for the rest of, uh, of your, um, your uh, meeting today. Um, but uh, it, it's uh, really important that this has taken place and, and appreciate uh, people's attendance at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Toby. Are you, are you able to stay for five minutes for a question? Or yeah, do you literally have to five answer? minutes, I'm afraid, Philip, yeah. Five, five minutes, that's, that's great. So does anyone have a, a question specifically for, for Toby? Uh, Toby Burke has his, had, has his hand up. Would you like to? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank, thanks very much, Chair. Uh, I, I would want to comment on what David has said as well, particularly in regard to the pandemic. But yeah. I appreciate Toby's got to go back to the to the house. Toby and uh, myself know each other as because of our work that we've been doing um, in regard to skills and apprenticeship. And I just wanted to say, Toby, um, <laughs> I'm surprised um, in your contribution. You only mentioned the word unions once. <clears throat> and that was in regard to the uh, the ending of the Union Learning Fund. Maybe I misheard it, but I think it would be helpful from Labour's point of view to point out the amount of work that we've been doing with the Manufacturing Skills uh, Alliance, uh, and we're trying to work with Labour on this to bring forward an overall strategy. I agree with you, Toby. The... Chambers of Commerce are not equipped to be able to handle what is going to be needed for the future. The people that can do that will be uh, the sets of skills councils, along with the unions, where we've got thousands upon thousands of, of, uh, of members and reps who are good at this, uh, and employers as well. Because we're going to need a massive skills revolution um, with the introduction of AI. And I... I just wondered, well, I won't let you uh, stay no, too long, Tony, but I think it'd be good if you could just tell us just yeah. tell us what you think of our Manufacturing Skills Alliance strategy. Okay, Th thanks very much. I, before, Sorry about before, that. 
before Toby before Toby responds, can I, uh, John? Have you got a question for Toby, and then yeah, you can take. Uh, yes, I have. Uh, I mean, it's really about uh, the way in which the government has structured it and how the labour movement should respond. Um, the government has decided that the future of our skills shall be in the hands of employers. Uh, from in a moment, I'll say why that is absolutely stupid. But the first thing is to say that if you think giving the power to chambers of commerce uh, will actually mobilize employers, then frankly, you haven't got out much. Uh, I mean, it is the most extraordinary decision. Someone ought to look at the membership of chambers of commerce, but particularly about the participation rate in chambers of commerce by important employers in particular areas. Uh, you're giving, in many ways, the future of our skills in this country to rather ill-prepared luncheon clubs. But let's okay, go a bit that. further back. Thanks, let, thanks. No, let me go to employers. Even if yeah. they gave it to employers, this will be a massive mistake because all the evidence over the last 30 years has shown that employers are very bad at identifying skills needs more than one or two years into the future. You ask employers what skills they need and they talk about current shortages. Very, very rarely do employers start thinking about what they will look like in five years, what their company will look like in five years and the skills they need. So you're going to have a sort of static uh, situation where the skills needs of this country are going to be defined by what was needed in the year 2000 or maybe even in 1990. It's an Thanks. absolutely Thanks. fatuous scheme and someone yeah. ought to do something about chambers of commerce yeah. and demonstrate what they are like in reality. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me just let me let Toby respond very quickly yeah, to those sorry, two. Yeah, because they're, they're really good points, but they're not. Um, but I, they, they are taking up the, the time I've got, unfortunately. Um, no, I mean Tony, I, you, you did miss me saying saying about trade unions on on a couple of other occasions, and certainly, you know, trade unions. I absolutely agree. Have a really central role um, in terms of uh, it, both in terms of, of um, negotiating. Uh, on uh, on collective plans going forward, but also absolutely uh, in terms of the uh, ensuring we have a skilled up workforce, and and in terms of the um, the work that's been done that you alluded to already in terms of manufacturing skills alliance, it, it's it's really valuable. Um, in terms, John, I mean, in terms of the chambers of commerce, just to in case I didn't explain, you know, we absolutely agree. Uh, with you that, that Chambers of Commerce are not the right organisation to be taking on this central role. They um, are, are often uh, not representative of many of their members. You know, there, there are lots, you know, lots of Chambers of Commerce have thousands of members and have, and have 15 or 20 that turn up to a meeting. Um, and so even in terms of their membership, which is a tiny fraction of all the businesses that exist, um, they are not, not even necessarily representative of those. Um, I think that this government very much are putting far too much store in the idea that employers, um, private sector employers particularly, are going to be the ones that are going to lead, lead a skills revolution. And, um, and we will be opposing that direction of travel, absolutely. Um, so if I didn't stress that strongly enough in, in my contribution, you know, we're in entirely the same place on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I know Toby has got yeah, to go now. Know, but but you may have thank heard you, my bell go you. in the background, but uh, it, it yeah. needs something to go right away. Thanks ever so much, guys. Thank you so much. OK, we, we've got uh, about 25 minutes because we'll stop at about 5 to 12 for just a little uh, comfort break. So we've got we've got plenty of time for questions. As I said before, um, uh, use use the chat function um, to to raise a question, or just put your put an electronic hand up, um, so we can put or or in Tom's case a a, a real hand. So um, Tom, do you want to do you want to come in now? Well, I was just going to suggest that we allow David to um, conclude his his input. Um, I think that's I think that's which, which very, I think was yeah, fascinating. That's that's, really a, that's, a, that's a good point, yeah. David. Is it? Would you like to just? Uh, 
add anything at this point. Okay, just a, just a little bit. I I I, I won't eat into our, our yeah. uh, a time for discussion. I think that'd be, that'd be much more fun than listening um, uh, to me. Um, I, I was talking about the um, the case of the ventilators uh, and the other case of uh, uh, emph emphasizing uh, British imp improvisational scientific genius was the the case of the um, of the of of the of the vaccine, um, and I think this is worth saying a little bit of, uh, about that. In fact, the UK, far from being an exporter of vaccines, has been a massive net importer uh, from the EU. The number of vaccines exported has been absolutely uh, uh, negligible. Uh, uh, in fact, so we have an extraordinary situation. We have the image of the UK as a pioneer in vaccines, um, supplying the world and doing it. Uh, because it was free, able to do it because it was free of the EU, but in fact been utterly dependent on EU supplies for perhaps half the vaccines at, 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 at one point, and maybe less than that um, uh, now. So there's been an extraordinary British vaccine nationalism. And, they, and here I think it's important to say that the Second World War was, in the British case, not a moment of nationalism, but of internationalism. And the very term people's war, uh, uh, which is now taken to mean national British people's war, was in fact much more significantly a term which referred to the peoples of the world fighting fascism uh, 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 together. But I, I'll, I'll end maybe with two thoughts. The first is that neither COVID nor war uh, are inherently socially progressive as the weird analysis we have of war and the analogies we make suggest. Right? We've got to disabuse ourselves of the notion of war as, as necessarily um, uh, uh, progressive. Uh, the second point is that we need to recognize that in the war and indeed after 1945, labor was never dominant in the creation of policy or in creation of um, of um, the ideas that shaped modern Britain. Uh, the welfare state indeed was built partly on uh, principles which Labour explicitly uh, rejected. So we need to take a, a, a double lesson really. Forget the war, especially the war that we've imagined since the 1960s and 70s. And secondly, uh, recognize um, the limited capacity of the Labour Party to change things, both in the war and after 1945. Recognise too the centrality of the power of the trade unions, historically, uh, which, which, which was the basis of Labour's uh, power, in Labour Party's power in uh, society. But most of all, think critically about what it would take for the Labour movement uh, broadly to, to seriously take a role in setting the agenda for future policy. And I think to do that properly, we need to, we, we need to take a critical look at, look at the, 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 uh, uh, the past and certainly a very critical look at the present. So Philip, I'll, 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 thank, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, David. And, and sorry to have to, to sort of truncate you, come tell you around. Adrian Williamson is waiting to ask a question. So let me uh, invite Adrian to come in. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Philip. Um, yes, David, I, I, um, one of the things you quite rightly uh, emphasise in, in your presentation is the very weak hold that Labour had over the working class vote uh, in the 1930s, um, slight, uh, in an overwhelmingly working class society and, and slightly improved in 1945 before falling back again. And it seems to me one, one of the um, problems uh, under which Labour has been labouring during the pandemic is, is the whole issue about the Red Wall, mm. the retreat of the Northern working class vote, etc, etc. Um, and, and I'm ju and just picking up, the, uh, just linking with that and the last thing you said, of course, uh, in, in 1940, the trade union movement was much, much stronger than it was ergo having to invite Ernie Bevin into the government and so on and so forth. Um, and, and I'm just, just wondering if there are any lessons for Labour's political strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Red Wall 
from from that that period reading a, or reading across to now or is or is the world so different um that um we can't li- really draw any conclusions at all but thank you thank you very much for, and uh, in a way you, you you've asked a question that i was uh, w- was on the tip of my tongue as well and i, I wanted to really um exploit the fact that we have both one of the leading historians of modern Britain here, but also one of the leading figures in, in the labor movement in, 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 in the form of Christina. Um, we, we live in very strange times, as, as you say. Um, you know, we saw this uh, very significant Tory victory at the end of, of 2019. And despite a series of reports highlighting failures of the government, uh, over the pandemic, it seems to have been incredibly difficult for Labour to make headway. Does that say something about the changing nature of the working class? Um, uh, and, and, and how does Labour deal with that? And maybe I could bring Christina in first and then ask David to, to comment. I suppose the key for me is, and I think it's always been the case, is that the working class are not a homogenous group. You know, they have the same um, interests and concerns and uh, leanings as any other group in society will have. And and I think it's always a mistake to try and treat them as a homogenous group. Mm. I think uh, they, like any other group, are, and this is my opinion, are much more likely now to go on issues rather than party political lines. And we saw that even in, I've forgotten where it was, the one that the Tories lost um, recently there, you know, where it was it was to do with the um, HS2. Humanity. Yeah, Amherst, yes, that's sir. it, to do with HS2. You know, people are voting on, sometimes on local issues, sometimes on bigger issues, but they're, and they're, I don't want to over, overstate the role of social media because I think it's easy to overstate that because in many cases you are speaking to a bubble or an echo chamber. Um, but obviously it has an impact and people are much more influenced now by uh, what they see politicians do on, on TV and on the media. Um, do they seem like, you know, we do focus groups all the time in unison as do I'm sure lots of other organisations. And I'm still astonished by the level of support there is for Boris Johnson. Uh, even among you know our members, public sector workers, uh, and it's it's quite often on fairly. Uh, uh, you know, he seems like a nice guy. He seems like a bit of fun. Um, I, I don't want to um, say that's the only reason people vote, but it's still there somehow. That people are not now voting on issues that are necessarily self-interest to them as a class or a group but issues that matter to them for a whole variety of other reasons, like what's happening in their local community or how they see somebody behave on TV. And, and people's standards, I think, have changed in that time, or clearly since the Second World War, the kind of behaviour that ministers and, and officials would have resigned over, even just 10 years ago, are very different from what they would resign over now. Uh, you know, um, uh, Hancock being a, a great example of that, you know, he was seen to have, um, uh, you know, he gave his, his pub landlord a contract, he went into business with his sister, there's that kind of underlying lo- level of corruption, and none of that was enough to make him resign, he resigned because he was caught, you know, with with having a, a relationship with somebody in his office, the last thing you should think you would have to resign for given the other more more serious issues that he was accused things he was accused of. Don't know if that helps, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, D- David. Would you like? To come? Yes, no, I very I very much agree with you know on everything you said, um, and, and and certainly on, on on the point that there, there isn't a, a as it were a single single working class, um, but. Um, no, I, I, I think that the, the, the problem Labour has is, it, it, is that it believes in the notion of the, of the Red Wall. I mean, it's central to its, its politics. And, and the notion of the Red Wall seems to me to be fundamentally a, a, um, a, a false one uh, at, at, many, at many different levels. I mean, um, uh, and I'll just give kind of one example. The implication of the Red Wall is that there have been these constituencies where the Labour, Labour vote has been solid, 
until 2019. If you actually look at the, at the, the share of the vote in those, in those, in those seats, they, uh, this is Christina's point in, a, in, a, in another, another form, um, it changes and it changes absolutely with national patterns. So in 1983, the Labour vote in the so-called Red War is catastrophically low. Um, it, then, it then recovers uh, uh, and peaks in 1997. It then falls as it does everywhere else, the Labour share of the vote and it recovers in 2017 um, uh, and it goes down again in, 20, in 2019. So the idea that there are these constituencies that vote differently from the, uh, the national trend is, is just plain cephalogically uh, uh, wrong. And, and, and the assumption that there, that there has been this ideologically consistent, um, politically consistent working class community in certain parts of the country that has suddenly uh, gone over to the Tories uh, is, is just insane. Uh, in fact, what's interesting about the Tory vote action is not that, it, that it's a spectacularly, it emerges spectacularly with Boris Johnson in 2019, is the Tories have added share of the vote in every general election since 1997. It's, it's a remarkable uh, long-term uh, uh, long -term, term trend, which, which Labour, I think, refuses to to, to, to appreciate, um, partly because it wants to kind of, uh, well, partly because it, it just gets its own electoral history completely wrong um, uh, and uh, doesn't want actually to look into the nature of the support that, that, it, that it has. Um, I mean, despite some rhetorical emphasis on, on, on looking for, for the new working class, it actually is not really interested in thinking about actual workers in, in, in Britain today, it's much more interested in retired workers in certain parts of the country that Labour's enemies have labelled the Red Wall. So the whole Red Wall is a recipe for intellectual and political catastrophe, it seems to me. And Thank you very much indeed. Who the real, who the real workers are is yeah. central to, to a new politics of Labour. And right. care workers will be a, a prime example of that. Not Thank associated you. with the Red Wall, by the way. David Coates has got his hand up, so can I invite David to come in? Uh, thanks very much, Philip. Um, I was very taken by David's final question, which is what would it take for the Labour movement to set the agenda for the future? And I suppose the starting point has to be to recognise that that's the right question. Um, if you're drawing a contrast between the wartime experience and today, what's most striking perhaps is the level of policy investigation and preparation that took place under the coalition government, both with Beveridge and with the uh, 1944 white paper uh, on full employment. And if you put those two things together, you know, they are the foundations of the post-war settlement. Um, but I wonder whether we need something similar today, something that is equally ambitious, far-reaching, and detailed in its investigation of how you ensure working people against social risk. Because if there is a reason for Labour's you know, consistent uh, inability to win general elections, it's that whatever offer it has made has not been sufficiently persuasive for a large enough number of people to convince them that Labour will take effective action to ensure them against social risk and to give them real opportunities choose lives that lives they have reason to value. Uh, <laughs> perhaps what we need is a commitment from the Labour front bench to undertake something with that scale of ambition, um, tinkering at the edges of a welfare state modified by long periods of Conservative government doesn't seem to me to be sufficient for the task. Um, and I think it starts to begin to answer uh, David Edgerton's question about, well, where do you find the new working class? Uh, forget about the Red Wall and retired workers. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I ask um, maybe Christina to comment on that first and then David? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure that, um, uh, that having, 
I do think they need to get a bit more radical in terms of the, the Labour Party needs to be a bit more radical in terms of the offer they have for working people. And it has to be something that resonates with people uh, and, uh, and offers them a different vision of what life can be like under a Labour government and a positive vision on that. And somebody described it to me the other day as saying, you know, uh, when you go to, uh, when you used to go to a travel agent and you looked at a, a, a picture of this would be a great holiday, and you'd say, well, look, that all, that all looks lovely. What? And if you think of that's the Tory offer, you know, this is this is the shiny vision that the Tories are offering. And if all Labour does is say, this is what's wrong with that offer, that's not good enough. And what you have to do is present Labour's shiny new vision so that people think, oh, that looks like a nice holiday, but that looks like an even better one. I'll go there. Uh, you know, it's a bit simplistic, but but I think it's a, it's a it is about saying change the change the tone, change the narrative, make it something so that it's simple. I mean, the Tories have got really good at you know the three the three word slogan. You know, um, get Brexit done, build back better. Um, you know the, these kind of things that it's easy for them to to uh, to just say these things, and it means next to nothing when you look at the detail underneath. Uh, but that that seems to be the way. Not everyone, but a lot of people are just take are, are voting on these kind of simple messages. And I wouldn't like to see Labour just entirely go down that way, but I think they do need a much simpler message. But I, I would say also, because we one of the reasons why I think, and it was interesting what um, David said there about the Tories have consistently put on uh, grown uh, support since 1997. Um, what Labour needs to do is get much better at targeting. So there was a time when they were good at targeting their resources in elections. And actually, it was done almost scientifically, where they looked at what, what the voting patterns were, they looked at historical voting patterns, they looked at what they had to do, how much how much shift they needed just to shift the vote in that, that constituency to actually win a seat. That all went out the window, as far as I could see, um, a few years ago, where we they weren't doing anything like that, where we were being told, and Tony might know this, as well, you know, every constituency was a target. Well, yeah, you might say that to the to the to the politics, to journalists, but internally, surely you had a system where you were saying, yeah, of course every seat's a target, but these are our key targets where if we could shift these, we could actually get a working majority. And they have to go back to that kind of almost scientific way of attacking um, uh, elections and seeing it like that. Where do I have to make that shift? What percentage do we need to do? As well as obviously getting the messaging right. Thank you very much. Dave, David, would you like to comment? Yes, I mean, I, I agree on the, the, the lack of a compelling story from, 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 from Labour and, and the turgidity of Keir Starmer's speech and indeed the, 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 the pamphlet illustrates that perfectly. I mean, this was an opportunity to tell a, a, a bigger story that could then be distilled down into a simple message. And, um, you know, apart from from aping the Tories and a bit of zombie Blairism, there's, 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 there's frankly nothing, frankly nothing there. Um, and to respond to the point about um, beverage and the 1944 uh, white white paper, uh, and indeed, and I need to elaborate on something Christina said. And I, I, I think a, a message centred on welfare is just not enough in, anymore. Um, it, it, it's got to be much more ambitious than, than that. It's got to be about. Um, the future of people's people's lives, uh, uh, irrespective of, uh, of of wealth, and I think it's important to to note that after 1945, Labour wasn't in fact focused on welfare as its central policies. I mean, that's what the histories tell us, but it was absolutely not not the case, except in 1959 and, and, and under Blair. And I think we need to recognise actually that, that, that the increases in, in welfare spending under un, 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 under Blair uh, were essentially a kind of continuation of of, of the Tory 1970s approach to, to welfare, which was targeting and, and means testing. Um, so if you're going to think about welfare in a distinctively labour way, you, you, you've got to go back to thinking about universalism and you've got to go to, to back to thinking about high levels of, 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 of benefits. So I would look not to, to beverage, uh, which is kind of very much a skinflint's welfare state, but actually to, the, to labour thinking in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, that resulted in the creation for the first time in the 70s of a relatively generous British welfare state. Um, think of SERPs 
uh, as, as a very important uh, uh, innovation at the 70, at the 70s then then of course uh, then of course thrown out so let so um, so I think really we ought to forget about the war um, uh, and think about the 1970s as the, as the moment when labor was last kind of creative uh, uh, in, a, in an autonomous uh, uh, in an autonomous sense and, and of course that's very that's very very difficult uh, for, for labor labor to do because it, it does mean asking some serious questions about what Thatcher did to the country, what New Labour did to the, to the country. Uh, and, and I think you know, celebrating you know, the work of a, of a decade, which is uh, 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 in, in our political discourse, uh, uniformly regarded as a disastrous one, wrong, wrongly so, in my view. Thank you very much indeed, David. Can I ask Claire to come in and ask a question? Thanks, Philip, and thank you, speakers. I just enjoyed that so much. I've got a question about the language of skill, um, which, which you know, came up very strongly in Christina's uh, talk, but also David kind of referenced it in his kind of uncomfortableness about the different labels that were used around skill during the war. Um, I suppose the question is, how do we change that sense that has deep historical roots about what skill actually is? and how it pertains to the definition of the work that um, in sectors such as the care sector, which are um, still very feminized sectors. And, and of course, because of that are seen as almost innately unskilled. How do we really, how do we use the language of skill without bringing all of that baggage um, about gender um, with it, I suppose is my question. Uh, Christina, would you like to come in first on that? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good question and kind of goes to the heart of the debate, doesn't it, about where you, how you shift the agenda on skills. And um, sadly, I don't have an easy answer for it, but I, I think it is inextricably linked with uh, with gender, but not just gender. There are other there are other bits in it, and I don't think you can necessarily um, separate them. And it is about um, so for us as a trade union, one of the key things we try and do is come up with, um, you know, job evaluation type structures where you you look at how you would measure the, the roles that people are doing, and then then you link that to pay. That's the kind of standard way of doing it, um, and it's about trying to. Uh, move away from the, the way that skill has always has traditionally been measured, which is in a sense, is it linked to something that people recognise as a qualification or a, um, a, something that's easily measured, you know, in, in relation to some sort of productivity type of activity and get back to, I suppose, impact as more than anything, you know, well, how do you measure the impact of the skills that people come and how do you measure this, the those skills which are, um, much more difficult to see or write down in a piece of paper, which is the kind of human interaction skills, and how would you measure the impact of that on individuals? And it, it also relates to the worth that you place on the on those particular jobs that people are actually performing. And because they were seen as traditionally women's jobs, if I can use that phrase, or women's skills, then they have traditionally always been undervalued. Uh, I think we need a, a much more directional, directed approach in different sectors. And I, I quite like Labour Party, the Labour Party's discussion around having some kind of sectoral, they're calling it sectoral bargaining, but some kind of sectoral direction for different parts of the economy. So like skills, like early years, being able to specify what it is you need to deliver a good service in those areas and therefore what skills you need. So what how many what's the work, what does the workforce look like? What level of skills do you need at different level? You know, not every job will be basic grade, you will have different different levels within them. That would take a political commitment from uh, from government, from employers, from local authorities that we're not we haven't got yet. And I think it's about trying to keep the pressure up to say, We've seen what's happened during the pandemic. There's been a new, hopefully, recognition of what is important. Let's build on that. 
but also there's an economic argument for some of these sectors, which is they, they are part of the infrastructure. And I think that's the case that needs to be made, not just don't see them as part of a drain on society. They have to be funded by taxpayers like early years, like care skills. Just as you need a, a transport infrastructure, you need a, a care and an early years infrastructure to enable society and work to continue to operate. And we're still miles away from making those cases. And I think if we could change the narrative around some of these services, that could make a significant difference into the way that we actually value and talk about the skills that people have in those sectors. Thank you very much indeed. David, would you like to comment? Yes. Um... I mean, I think, and tragically, the, the government is, is essentially got through uh, um, most, most of the pandemic without doing very much about, um, uh, and caring, caring very much at all about the workers in, uh, in, all, in all these essential industries that we've, that we've, that we've talked about. So I, I'm not very optimistic, I have to say, about that. And in, in the end, it, it, it's about politics. It's not about uh, the, 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 um, the, the particular importance of workers. Uh, and the government has... has Really made sure that that, that uh, the importance of workers is not reflected in its in its in its, in its politics. So that's tricky. On the on the question of skills, yes, um, I was very very conscious um, that that uh, I, I was using the the, well, the statistical language of the time, um, and and in that uh, skilled meant time served. Uh, so almost by definition excluded women from that 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 that, that category. Uh, but ha having said that, there was a, there was a, another discourse uh, around around skill, a very general discourse um, in in the in the in the forties, which is a, about the skilled nature of the British working class in general, including women. Uh, uh, so the, the notion that the British worker was peculiarly skilled, uh, um, whether craft worker or, or or not, was really very very important. To the to, to 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 propaganda around work and to the self consciousness, I think, of, of, of British British workers. I mean, the, the general view in, in in commentary today is, is of course, is that the British workforce is in general unskilled. I mean, not 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 just the, the the sort of workers that Christina has focused on in in in, in her talk, but in every sector of, 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 of the economy, skills are, are are insufficient compared, typically with with uh, with with, uh, with with Germany. So yes, there's, there's there's an awful lot to 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 to, un, to, to un, un, unpack there, including absolutely the gender question, but many other many other sorts of discourses around work as well. Yeah. Thank I, you very I much, David. Back, yeah, of course. Just, I just thought what's interesting is if you look at what happened during the just recently there when we talked about the shortage of HGV drivers, which you know I, I would absolutely agree is a skilled a skilled occupation in in, in one sense. Um, and all of a sudden you had politicians talking about, well, we're going to have to do something to improve their pay and get people in. And, and yet we've had, we've had a shortage in social care of 110,000, 120,000 workers. There's 100,000 shortage in the NHS. And they, they talk a bit about the NHS because they talk about the shortage of nurses and doctors, et cetera. But actually, if you look at care, it's one of the biggest areas where there's a huge shortage. They never talk about it in those terms. <coughs> You don't hear government ministers say that means we're going to have to bump the pay up, we're going to have to make it easier for, you know, reverse some of the des stupid decisions we take took over Brexit and actually call them skilled workers and let them come in from other countries. And it's just, and I, I you, you can't help but think that is definitely based on gender. You know, that HGV drivers are probably predominantly men and care workers are predominantly women. Thank you very much indeed.